You know, when you hear gospel truth, your heart burns within you because it's home. Wh whoever you are, wherever you're from, the gospel is home. It's, it's the home God has prepared for the human race because it's through the grace of God demonstrated through the gospel, the complete forgiveness for all of our sins that we have become home to where we are to be. God hears all those languages. Jesus hears all those languages from the people of God around the world who are worshiping him. I love that. You can't deliver yourself out of bondage. If you could, you wouldn't need a savior. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not something you can do. You can receive it, you can believe it, and you can receive it, but even that's not a work. And, and so when people hear the gospel and believe it, they are brought out of Egypt. This book of the Bible is about Jesus and what Jesus has done. And I'm going to learn about that all my life. Many years ago, I can't remember how many years ago it was, I was in Israel and I got to walk on the road to Emmaus. Remember in Luke 24, where after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize him. Uh, God shielded them from recognizing that it was Jesus. And he began to talk with them. Remember that? He walked all the way to Emmaus with them. And they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. They invited him to stay with them. And, and he began to break bread and have communion with them, just as we have. And then he disappeared. <laughs> That would get your attention, wouldn't it? If Pastor John was up here one day and he just suddenly, poof, disappeared. Well, they said, well, didn't our hearts burn within us? You know, when you hear gospel truth, your heart burns within you because it's home. Wh wh whoever you are, wherever you're from, the gospel is home. It's, it's the home God has prepared for the human race because it's through the grace of God demonstrated through the gospel, the complete forgiveness for all of our sins that we have, we come home to where we are to be. You know, just uh, thought on the side, I really enjoy being in churches that their primary language is not mine. There's such a sense and, a, and an awareness w when you're in a church service where you know, maybe uh, is your Tamil. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if you speak Telugu or some of the other languages, Hindi. But if you were in a service where you didn't know that language, you'd have the same sensation. But for me, I just think about Jesus and how he understands Tamil perfectly, and he speaks it perfectly. And not only that, but he speaks Mandarin. He understands Cantonese. He understands Japanese and German and French and Swiss, and every language in the continent of Africa. And, and in this 48-hour period, because, you know, we're in a globe, and right now it's Saturday in the Western Hemisphere in some countries, and here it's Sunday here. But during those 48 hours, God hears all those languages. Jesus hears all those languages from the people of God around the world who are worshiping him. I love that. And, uh, well, I was on the road to Emmaus. They, what they believe is, is the road to Emmaus, and it was... Such a heavenly experience. It's really hard to describe. When I was in the States just now, I was in the place where I was born, and it's very green because it rains a lot, very cool, and uh, spring is in the air. Now, in Singapore, we're blessed with spring all year round, but if you're in a place where it's been winter and the flowers begin to bloom and the colors begin to come out, there's such a freshness in that. And that's what the road to Emmaus was like for me in my spirit, to think Jesus was actually here and he was explaining to the disciples about the word of God. And what he told them was when, when they said to Jesus on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and his companion, they said, you know, Jesus said, why are you so, I'm paraphrasing, why are you so sad? They said, well, you know, are you the only one visitor to Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened? Uh, and, and so the, 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 he said, uh, we thought 
this was the Messiah, that he was going to save us, but he was crucified. And so Jesus said, oh, foolish ones and slow to believe. He said, don't you know that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to enter into his glory and that all the prophets of the Old Testament and all the, the law and the prophets testified to this. So that's God's main message is that the Messiah had to come and suffer and die for us and, and, and then enter into glory through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this was not just a temporary condition for the human race, you know, where we go through bad times and so we need redemption or, you know, we make a few mistakes and we need redemption. No, the whole human race was lost. <laughs> you know, the whole human race was, was dead in sin. And as bad as and hard as life can be, because this is a fallen world, uh, for those that, that, if God had not provided a way of escape, these sorrows and difficulties that we experience in life would become our eternal destiny and on a much deeper and greater scale. So people's problems don't just end when they die. That's why suicide is such a deception. It's such a tragic mistake because that does not improve a person's lot. It only makes it worse, eternally worse. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that if a Christian were to commit suicide that they would go to hell. I don't believe that. Uh, as, as my, uh, you know, father in the faith said, a person can be sick in their head just like they can be sick in their stomach. If you, if you die with a stomach ache, you're not going to go to hell. And people that uh, are so tormented by Satan that they take their lives, that doesn't mean they, they've committed the unpardonable sin, not at all. But someone that doesn't know Jesus, it's not going to improve their life. Amen. Well, so the, the, the world was just in this, this state, this condition where it was absolutely lost. Uh, having a Savior was not optional. It wasn't just a nice idea. It wasn't a good thought. Just a good thought. It was a good thought, but it wasn't just a, a good thought. It was something that without it, we would perish eternally. Well, um, I thought it was interesting. Uh, some of the slides we had this morning, I love the selection of the psalm, Psalm 119. What a beautiful psalm. Uh, sometimes when I would read it, I really felt convicted. Have you ever read some scriptures that may kind of make you feel bad? <laughs> like, Yee. this person says, I'm blameless. I follow you with all my heart without any blame. Oh, and I'm thinking, ah, I don't know if I can say that, Lord. There were some psalms I just sort of like took a detour around because I thought, um, I can't say that. And there's one there, I forget which one it is, where he calls down curses on himself. If I've done this, Lord, <laughs> you know, if I've been, you know, dishonest or, or, or I'm making, making it up, but it would be like saying, you know, if I've said anything negative about anyone or if I've been judgmental or critical or unbelieving, then, you know, let fire fall on me. And I'm thinking, ah, I can't pray that. I think I'll just save that one till I get to heaven. So, uh, the road to Emmaus, what Jesus said there really helped me with regard to the Psalms, because he said in Luke 24, you can read it yourselves in Luke 24, that the, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets are, speak about me. And that's just a shorthand way of saying the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament. That was the, the words they used when they said the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. That's all the books of the Old Testament. And he said, they speak about me. Now, we were also on the slides as we're talking about, let's see, coming out of Egypt and, and so on. And, and I was thinking about that. Now, there was one line at the end there, and I thought, well, that could be good. <laughs> that, that could be a good thought, or it might be a troubling thought. It said at the very end, it said, um, you know, Israel was in Egypt. They were in bondage. Uh, it took a few days, you know, to, to get them out of Egypt, but it took years to get Egypt out of them. Well, that's, that's true. And you know what? Um, Egypt never really left them. 
come back to that thought. Uh, but then it said, uh, you too can leave your, you, you too can, you know, be rescued, but you have to leave your Egypt first. Well, I thought, okay, if we understand that in the context of the book of Exodus, it's okay. And what happened in the book of Exodus is that God and only God delivered them. You can't deliver yourself out of bondage. If you could, you wouldn't need a savior. But if we're not careful, we can very subtly leave that impression with people about Christianity that if you'll just clean yourself up and, and, and get rid of your addictions and your bad temper, then you'll walk out of your Egypt. And that gets it exactly backwards. What happened is God delivered them. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not something you can do. You can receive it, you can believe it, and you can receive it, but even that's not a work. And, and so when people hear the gospel and believe it, they are brought out of Egypt. Now we know that we're not sanctified instantly. We still, we still grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But going back to the road to Emmaus, what that conversation should tell you is this book of the Bible is about Jesus and what Jesus has done and I'm going to learn about that all my life it's not about me doing something to earn my salvation or to uh, 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 you know if I can just Please God first, then he'll save me. Well, that, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he saved you when you were dead in sin, ungodly, uh, an enemy, hostile, uh, helpless, and hopeless. That's when, that's when God saved you. And when you heard that gospel and believed it, it's a creative word. It's a creative word. God creates with his words. And so that's what preaching the gospel is, is that Jesus died for your sins. And when you believe that, that word, God recreates you through his word and you become a child of God and your sins are blotted out and you, are, you pass from, from death unto life, from darkness into light. You, you are brought out of Egypt with him. Now, here's what the Old Testament will tell you, if I could just sum it up in a nutshell, is that there's no one perfect but Jesus. And the Psalms are a, 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 a mini picture of that. They are reflections of what was going on in Israel th throughout their history. They're part of Israel's worship. And they speak many times, the, well, all the psalmists were prophets because all of their psalms ended up in the Bible, which means all of their psalms were inspired, the inspired word of God. Well, you don't get your books in the Bible unless you are a prophet or an apostle of God. And the book, the Bible's done, so... Don't try to write any books to get yours in the Bible. But those, those psalmists were prophets. And they spoke for the Lord. And, and also, many times they were speaking, well, they're speaking on behalf of the whole nation of Israel. And particularly on behalf of the king. And in many cases, the psalmist was the king. You know, David, and Solomon. So there's more going on there than we realize often with the book of Psalms. Psalms is the third largest book in the Bible after Jeremiah and Genesis. So it, it occupies a lot of real estate in the Old Testament. Jesus quoted the book of Psalms more than any other book of the Bible. And the writers of the New Testament quoted the book of Psalms more than any other book of the Bible. So how important is the Psalms? It's clear that Jesus was praying them and meditating on them day and night. In fact, the first psalm, uh, scholars 
I think universally believe, is really about Jesus. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Let's stop there. None of us have done that perfectly throughout our lives. At one time or another, and not just before you were born again, from time to time we listen to the counsel of the ungodly. And it might just be the devil. Or it could be, you know, something on television or movies or something. Stand in the path of sinners. Well, if you sin... I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you still sin from time to time? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I don't need to. to. <laughs> we all sin. So this cannot be describing you and me, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. It's so easy to be scornful. And then come to church and look so sanctified. Then you go on to the next verse. His delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law, or that means in the instruction of the Lord. He meditates day and night. Well, that, that's describing Jesus. And Psalm 2 describes Jesus. Going on up to Psalm 119, as we were saying earlier, you find that as you read that psalm, if you will begin to understand that the psalmist here is speaking as a prophet. Now, you have to, you, you, you first, when you read the psalms, you want to ask, you, you should, if you, if you can know, who wrote this? Most Bibles will tell you. Uh, it's part of the Psalter. Who wrote it? And, and it's not always easy to know what was happening to the psalmist at the time he wrote that psalm or spoke it, what he was going through. But sometimes you might have study books that'll tell you, you know, David was uh, uh, fleeing Saul or he was going through some situation. But the psalms really are designed to have a universal application. To all believers everywhere in every nation in every age. And, and so, yes, the psalmist is speaking on behalf of himself. It's good to ask, what's he going through? But sometimes, you know, he's speaking in the name of the Lord. He is speaking uh, about Jesus. And you'll see, you'll go through that. For example, if you read Psalm 119, this, this set me free once when I realized this. I, thought, I can't live up to this psalm. Try as I might. I, 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 I cannot be as good as this person saying. And it surprises me that David is even saying it. Because David didn't do it either. And then I realized, this is talking about Jesus. And it's talking about you insofar as you are in him. In other words, this has already taken place. So in him I can say, my heart is blameless. I follow you with all of my being. Because I'm in him. I'm in the Son of God. Who, who obeyed the Father with no motive less worthy than pure and perfect filial love. He did not love the Father because he had to or he was afraid of being punished uh, or, or, you know, he was trying to get a position. No, he just has eternally loved his Father as the Son. Such pure love. Who could attain to that? Who could be that? Who could do that? But Jesus, the Bible is a book primarily about one person. And his name is Jesus. And when I saw, wait a minute, I can pray some of these psalms because he said, I, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And he not only was punished for my sins and bore the unmitigated wrath of God. Unmitigated wrath of God. Have you ever seen video of the re-entry of space vehicles into the earth. Have you ever seen the fire uh, around the, the shield? Some of you men are nodding. Some of the women are wondering, what are you talking about? But guys, for, for your wives, you might just pull that up on a YouTube where they've gotten, they've got video of the, the fierce fire that envelops that space capsules. It's coming back to earth. I really think that's a good picture of the unmitigated fire that was poured out upon Jesus because of 
my sins. So there was no shred of punishment left undone. You know, if you have a nagging guilt about something and feel like, you know, I, I deserve to be punished for that. Well, let me tell you, uh, Jesus bore every shred of that wrath. God did not hold back on him. But that's not all. He not only bore the punishment, he fulfilled the law. He obeyed everything that is required of us so that we can read a psalm like Psalm 119 and realize I'm in him and this applies to me. In fact, when you read the psalms, you really want to ask, what does this have to do with Jesus? How does this reveal Jesus? And I'm not talking about finding hidden symbols or a secret code keys and something no one else has ever thought of before. Listen, if you get a revelation from the Bible that no one else has ever thought of before, forget about it. Because God has been revealing himself to the human race from the beginning. And if it's really something true about the Bible, God has shown it to many. Okay, It wouldn't be safe to give one human being some knowledge that no other human beings. Can you imagine what we'd do with that? We would just distort it and misuse it. No. So I'm not talking about finding secret symbols. I, I, I'm saying, ask yourself, well, what does this have to do with, with Christ and redemption? And then, what does it have to do with me? Now, for example, you will see some Psalms where there's just great defeat and they are a mirror, as I said earlier, of Israel's journey and of the, the journey of the human race. The very first time the gospel was preached was in Genesis 3.15, where the Lord said to the serpent that there will be enmity between your seed and her seed. And, and her seed will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. That is an, an in. Uh, intense summation of the entire Bible. The seed of the woman is obviously Jesus, born of a virgin. And, and uh, he has crushed Satan through the cross and we are waiting for the completion of our redemption in the resurrection. But in that process, Satan uh, he suffered when it says he will bruise your heel. So if, if the serpent, and imagine Satan, what kind of venom he has. If he bruises your heel, if he bites you, it, it, it signifies pain, suffering in the midst of overcoming that. And so the seed of the woman then, we follow that down through the Bible, through Seth. It leads to, you know, uh, uh, Noah. And, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Israel from the, from the sons of Jacob. And all of them were flawed. We like to talk about so-and-so did this, and he was a great man of this, a great man of that, but we don't talk about the great failures that were in that person's life. David's a great example. But Abraham too, and Isaac, and Jacob. And then the 12 sons of Jacob were a mess. That was a completely dysfunctional family. And this is who the Savior of the world is to come through. Think about it. Judah, you know, Jesus is descended from the tribe of Judah, but uh, he descended through Perez, and Perez was born of the incestuous union between Tamar and Judah. And Tamar posed as a prostitute in order to get Judah to sleep with her to fulfill his legal obligation to her to provide her a husband. This is in the history, the genealogy of Jesus. And then, of course, you have David and Bathsheba. She's in the gene genealogy of Jesus. You have Ruth. She is a Moabitess. The Moabites were the fruit of the incestuous union between Lot and his daughters. What is God saying? You know, if you had written the Bible, what would you have done? I, I feel sure you would have done exactly what I would do. I would have had Jesus have a pristine, 
perfect lineage. You know, full of people who can just deliver themselves from Egypt. If you want to come to Jesus, get rid of your addictions. Get rid of your bad thoughts. Get rid of your bad habits. And then you'll be able to come out of Egypt. That's absolutely not what the Bible says. The Bible says, despair that you can save yourself and realize how much you need the Savior. And that's what the Bible's telling us through the history of Israel. These were not perfect people. The story of Joseph is almost more a story of the other brothers than it is of Joseph. And there's this remarkable transformation. Even Joseph isn't perfect. But you have this Judah who's this murderous thug in the beginning, sells his brother. But you know, in the, in, in the end, and he, did he deceive their father and... and but in the end, it's Judah who says, I, I will give my life for Benjamin. We've got to go back to Egypt to get the food. They don't know that Joseph is their brother. Joseph says, bring your little brother. His father doesn't want to give up his, his last son from Rachel. Judah says, I, I'll, my life for his. So he's, he's gone from being a sinner to a savior, so to speak. So the history of Israel many times is reflected in the Psalms. And what you'll see is you'll see times of great victory. And you'll see times of great disaster and disobedience and rebellion and idolatry. And then uh, the prophets begin to say, if you don't repent, you're going to go into captivity. And you know what they do? They go into captivity. And then the prophets begin to say, well, you know, the, the, in the future, it's going to be a glorious kingdom. And... and uh, you know, God's going to restore this and this and so on and so forth. But when they came back from captivity, it was just sort of like things fizzled out. You know, we have fireworks. You know, I don't know if you've ever lit fireworks, but sometimes you get what we call a dud. And you light it and it just, it doesn't do anything. It just, and that's what the, the rest of the Old Testament seems to be like. It's like a dud. Well, I mean, where is this glorious restoration? Where is this? fabulous kingdom we're talking about, this temple. And so what you see happening when Jesus comes on the scene, you know, just like Israel, he's called out of Egypt. And whereas in the Old Testament, God calls Adam his son, but Adam failed. And then he calls, okay, I'll, I'll raise up a nation through Abraham, which, by the way, this church is the fruit of that Abrahamic promise and every church around the world of every culture and nation because God said, I will make of you a great nation. Uh, through you, through this, this seed, I will, I will bless all the nations of the earth. But friends, we were, we were outside the covenant to begin with. We were without God and without hope in the world. He didn't have to include us. But that was the gospel. Here's this group of human beings on the planet earth who are hopeless, helpless. They're in bondage. They can't deliver themselves. God is the deliverer. God is the savior. He saves us. And so you, you see then this history of, 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 of victory and defeat in Israel. And you, you quickly realize there's nobody perfect. Nobody in this bunch is going to get this job done except... This one person emerges. In the beginning, God calls, okay, Israel, now you're my son. You go do my will. But they failed. They were called the servant of the Lord. And if you read in, the cha the, in Isaiah, in the, in the chapters around in the 40s, you'll see where God, the prophet changes from speaking about Israel as the servant of Yahweh to this one solitary individual, this strange who is this person? Like the Ethiopian eunuch asked Philip, who is this? Is he talking about himself? Or is, who is the prophet talking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Remember that in the book of Acts where, where Philip comes across the Ethiopian eunuch and he's reading the book of Isaiah and he's asking, who's he talking about? And Philip said, the Bible says that from that point, Philip, Philip began to preach Jesus to him. So you see this solitary figure in the book of Isaiah who's the servant of Yahweh, and, and he does other strange things to a Jew. This is strange because a Messiah 
is blessed of the Lord. A Messiah is one who is God's chosen. But in Isaiah, this servant of Yahweh is crucified. And the Bible says anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. That's, you know, you, you see why this is troubling to the Jews. It's, it's a stumbling block. And, and not only that, it says he's numbered with the transgressors. This servant of Yahweh is the one who gets the job done. He's the only one. And he makes intercession. He's numbered with the transgressors. That's us. Can everybody say amen? amen? That's you and me. And he makes intercession for them. Now, when you see in the book of Psalms, you'll see some Psalms, you'll think, oh no, you, that can't be Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm not saying, because there's times in the Psalms where you, you, if you know your Bible and you will see that the psalmist is very often quoting scriptures in the Gospels or in the New Testament that are applied to Jesus. But sometimes in that psalm, you'll, you'll hear the psalmist saying, you know my transgressions. And, and you know, do not hold my sins against me. And you think, well, that, that can't be talking about Jesus because he never sinned. And that's right, he, he never did. But he so identifies with us as his people like Daniel if you know the book of Daniel Daniel made intercession for the nation and Daniel was the holiest guy in the nation he was a holy man of God but Daniel when he made confession for the sins of the people when he interceded for the nation he identified with their sins and so Daniel begins to say confess things that it's not things that he himself did. There were things that the nation did. But he says, Lord, we, we have done this. We have done that. I understand that because for many years I was a lawyer. And lawyers all over the world, they identify with their client. And many times when I would speak to the judge, I would say, Your Honor, we... violated that law but we plead in our defense well the lawyer didn't do it but the lawyer identifies the advocate identifies so closely that it's as though they become one person and in, and in fact that's exactly with what happened with Jesus that he became one with you in a way that no other human advocate co could he so identified with you, he exchanged places with you. You could say he got in your skin. He became you. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said he became the greatest murderer, the greatest blasphemer, the greatest adulterer. It's just scary even to say it like that, but you have to understand, Jesus, just like the lawyer, the lawyer didn't commit the crime, the lawyer didn't create the problem. But the lawyer is identifying with the client. Jesus did not sin. He's never sinned. He's always sinless. And because he was sinless, he could take your place. And he so identifies with us. He's numbered with us. That you'll sometimes see. Not always. You're going to have to read this. This would require a seminar to go into more detail. But you just have to read this on. But you will see. If you know the Gospels, you know the Bible. You'll see that sometimes... The psalm, as I said, the psalmist is quoting scriptures that clearly are applied to Jesus. But if the psalmist, who is speaking as a prophet on behalf of the king, and who is the king of Israel? How do you say yeah, Jesus in, in Tamil, Jesus Messiah? I like that. I could sing that part. Who is the Messiah? It's Jesus. Who is the king of Israel? It's Jesus. But our king unlike earthly kings, humbled himself, became a servant, be, became obedient unto death, identified with my sins and your sins, took our place, and uh, exchanged places with us so that he took our sin and gave us his righteousness. So that's why in the psalm sometimes, the psalmist speaking on behalf of the king who is Christ, speaking on behalf of the Lord, you'll see him 
confessing our sins as though they're his own. My, that helped me, brothers and sisters. That helped me. That brings it home. That brings it, it's so intimate. It's so near. It's so close. You know, because you look back and you're so ashamed and you think, oh Lord. You kind of think, well, he just tolerates me. You know, he, how, you know, he doesn't really like me. He just, he just tolerates me because he's God and he has to do that, you know. But, you know, I'm not like Pastor John. I'm not like Brother So-and-so. You know, he just likes me, but kind of like I have body odor and doesn't want to get too close to me. You know, like Martin Luther said, he got down in the mud and the muck. In the in the in into our sin, and you know when he identified with it so closely that legally the law had to curse him. Isn't that mind blowing? The law was designed to punish transgression, and so when Jesus said, "Father, I'll go, I'll take their sin," and he identified with it so closely, the, there was no option but the law had to curse him. He didn't just theoretically come under a curse. He bore the curse. He bore the cancer. He didn't theoretically bear the cancer. He didn't theoretically bear the shame and the, and the pit and destruction that our own sins and mistakes bring in our lives. He absolutely did that. And when I saw that, first of all, when Jesus, when the psalmist is talking about how pure and blameless he is, thank God I can say that because of what Jesus did. He did that for me. He fulfilled the law and the prophets for me. And I can say this with a good conscience before God. My past is blotted out. His life is mine. His works are mine. It's as though he, you yourself did it. And when I see that he, he didn't just forgive me at a distance, but he came and he took my sins and it, it's a, when I read some of those psalms it's almost I, I picture myself like standing beside Jesus my advocate and I expect him to say you know Lord he did this and this and this and this and you know can we try to forgive him and then but suddenly I hear this voice saying Father forgive me I was foolish I transgressed and I'm thinking what? and it's like he's pushing me back, stepping up and saying, I sinned, Father. I did this. I did that. This shame is mine. That's just amazing. One last thought. Sometimes in the Psalms you'll see where the psalmist is in a desperate condition. Psalm 88 is a good example. I don't have time to go into that. You read it. There's one glimmer of hope in that psalm, and it's the very first verse, and after that it goes downhill. It's called a lament or a complaint, but it's unique because most of the laments end on a note of victory. Psalm 88 ends on a... On the last word in the Hebrew is darkness. And that psalm goes from here and... You know, when you look at that, you think... I don't think I'll read that one. It's kind of like a construction site. We have a lot of construction sites on, in Singapore. And, you know, blinking signs that tell you to drive around this or on the, on the path, footpath, go around. It's a deep pit. That's the way, you know, I think a lot of people think of Psalm 88. Oh, there's warning lights here. <laughs> go, go around this one because it's dark. It's called the saddest, gloomiest psalm in the Bible. It's one, one person said, one wail of sorrow from beginning to end. The psalmist is, is in worse shape at the end than he was in the beginning. So why would anybody read that? Because that, that is a picture of a man under a curse. Forsaken, forgotten, abandoned in the grave. And that is what Jesus did when he took your place. You know, in life, we go through things that look desperate, dark. They, they are the echo of the fall because we're in a fallen world and we're not perfect. We make mistakes. Sometimes, sometimes our worst situations are the result of our own mistakes or wrongdoing. 
And we think to ourselves, well, I deserve this. I deserve to be in a pit. I deserve this to be hopeless. Yeah, you do. So do I. But Jesus went to the pit for you. And that's why Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. No matter what fix you've gotten yourself into, let me finish with this thought. Maybe someday I'll come back and preach all of Psalm 88. No matter what you've gotten yourself into, Jesus has redeemed you from the pit. He took your place. And that psalm really describes both the believer and the unbeliever. For the believer, this is what Jesus bore for you. For the unbeliever, on so very soberly, it describes not only the unbeliever's present plight, but also their eternal condition if they, if they reject Jesus and do not accept what he did for them. I want to lead you in a, a prayer right now and also for the sake of those who are watching by YouTube. Would you pray with me? Uh, Heavenly Father, I ask you to make this real to all who have heard, all who have listened today. And I especially pray for those who may not know Jesus. Father, that they could know there's hope. We have a Savior who's so identified with us that he took our place. And if you are listening and you are in a desperate place, you see no way out. I want you to know that Jesus took your place and, and he went into the pit of destruction for you and he was raised from the dead. We've just celebrated Easter, Resurrection Day. Jesus rose from the dead, came out of that pit, out of yours and mine, and he has given us the victory. When you confess Jesus as Lord and you call on his name, Jesus save me. You are delivered out of your place of bondage, out of your Egypt. You are seated with him in heavenly places and you will see a victory in that situation if you'll put your trust in the Lord, in Jesus, not just in a higher power, not just uh, in general terms, but in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and tell him, Jesus, you are my Savior I, I, I believe you died for my sins and, and that I am forgiven and that you have delivered me, my life from destruction. Sooner or later, you will see that manifest in your life. Amen. 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 God bless you.